So we'll be starting shortly. We'll wait one more minute. Okay, so um, hello everyone and welcome to the 10th annual World Wetlands Day Symposium hosted by the University of Waterloo together with the Waterloo Public Library. Uh, my name is uh, Philippe Van Capellen. I'm a professor at the University of Waterloo where I lead the Eco Hydrology Research Group and our group's uh, research centers on water resources in general and on water quality in particular. Uh, first, some housekeeping. Uh, if you're not familiar or not that familiar with Zoom webinars, uh, please note that your mic and video will be automatically shut off for, for the entire duration of tonight's event. So to ask a question for our distinguished lecturer or our panelists, please use the Q&A chat feature by pressing on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It's indicated here with a yellow arrow. Um, <clears throat> your question will be anonymous and will only be seen by the host. So feel free to ask a question at any time during the event, but note that questions will only be answered during the designated Q&A periods. And also note that there may not be enough time to go over all the questions. You can also leave this event at any time by pressing the leave button in the bottom right corner. The event is being recorded and will be shared among social platforms. I would like now to start with a land acknowledgement. So I am speaking to you from my home in Kitchener, and I acknowledge that my house is located on the Haldeman Tract, the land that was granted to the Haudenosaunee or the Six Nations of the Grand River, and located within the territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our ability to be living and working here now in Waterloo Region, in Ontario, in Canada, is a direct outcome of policies of expulsion and assimilation of Indigenous peoples during the time of settlement and confederation and since then. The harms of these policies are many and are still being felt in indigenous communities today. We therefore have a responsibility to acknowledge and understand this history and the current experience of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. And for this understanding to inform the work that we do so that first we can stop perpetuating the damages of colonization and second to begin to repair them. Land acknowledgements are just one small first step in doing this work. On this World Wetlands Day, I would ask you to please take a moment to recognize the key role of indigenous peoples play in understanding, nurturing, and protecting our shared wetlands. World Wetlands Day is an international day adopted by the United Nations General Assembly to celebrate and heighten awareness of the critical importance of wetlands to people and the planet. World Wetlands Day is celebrated every 2nd of February since 1997 in recognition of the Convention on Wetlands, also known as the Ramsar Convention, which was signed in 1971 as an international treaty. So each year, a different theme is selected for World Wetlands Day. The theme for this year is Wetlands Action for People and Nature, highlighting the importance of actions to ensure the conservation and sustainable use of wetlands for humans and for planetary health. A wetland is where land meets water either salt, fresh, or somewhere in between. Marshes and ponds, the edge of a lake or an ocean, the delta at the mouth of a river, low-lying areas that frequently flood, these are all examples of wetlands. Now, roughly 6% of the Earth's land surface is covered by wetlands. And of this 6%, a quarter is located within Canada. Our country, therefore, has a special responsibility to protect this important natural capital, not just for Canadians, but for people all over the world. Sadly, 35% of the world wetlands have been lost since 1970 and 85% since the 1700s. Because of this, wetland plants, species, and animals are at risk of extinction, while also threatening human well being, livelihoods, food and water security, and the health of the planet. It is urgent that we raise national and global awareness about wetlands in order to reverse their rapid loss and encourage actions to conserve and restore them. World Wetlands Day is the ideal time to increase 
people's understanding of these critically important ecosystems. Since 2013, the Eco Hydrology Research Group at the University of Waterloo has been organizing a symposium to celebrate World Wetlands Day. So today is our 10th anniversary symposium, thanks to the efforts not only of our group, but also of that of wetland researchers across the university. I also want to acknowledge that starting last year, we have been partnering with the Public Library of Waterloo, with the Portaloo Public Library to organize this symposium virtually. Now, without further ado, I am turning the floor over to Professor Ferdun Rezanezad, who will pay a special tribute to one of Canada's wetland champions. Ferdun? Okay, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, happy World Best Lands Day. Uh, my name is Ferdun Rezanezad. I'm a research associate prop at the University of Waterloo. Today, World Wetlands Day is perfect opportunity to acknowledge Professor Jonathan Price, who retires after an impactful 30-year career in wetland science. It's a great honor for me to say a few words about my friend, colleague, and mentor, Professor Price. John is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo. He is an internationally recognized researcher specialized in the hydrology of peat dominated wetlands. John is leading the Wetlands Hydrology Research Laboratory and over his career, he supervised 42 master students, 14 PhD and eight postdoctoral fellows. He authored and co-authored over 200 journal articles on topics including soil water physics, water quality, contaminant transport, ecology, soil development in wetlands. John. Today, World Wetlands Day is an excellent opportunity for us to wish you well in retirement. From all of us, we wish you all the best. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, to celebrate John's significant contributions in wetland science, there was an article released this morning by the Water Institute at the University of Waterloo. We invite you to read this article. And there was another article released this morning on the record highlighting uh, an economic model fund that Ontario's wetlands provide 4.2 billion worth of natural filtration to keep drinking water clean. Again, we invite you to read this article interesting about the wetlands. Okay, now I would like to introduce the moderator for today's event, Dr. Maria Strzok a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo. Okay, Maria, floor is yours. Thanks very much, Feridun. And it's uh, my great pleasure that I get to moderate the event tonight and in particular, start off by introducing our distinguished lect lecturer this evening. Um, so I'm pleased to in introduce Dr. Kelsey Leonard. Uh, Dr. Leonard is an assistant professor and a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Waters climate and sustainability at the University of Waterloo. Her expertise lies in indigenous water justice in the Great Lakes and Atlantic region. She represents the Shinnecock Indian Nation on the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean, serves as a member of the Great Lakes Water Quality Board of the International Joint Commission, and is a member of the National Ocean Protection Coalition Science Advisory Team and Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature Academic Hub. Dr. Leonard's TED Talk, Why Lakes and Rivers Should Have the Same Rights as Humans, has over 3.3 million views. So we're really lucky uh, to hear from her tonight and, and excited to, to welcome her. So Kelsey, the floor is yours when you're ready. And I look forward to, to your talk. Brittany, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction uh, and to uh, everyone uh, for the invitation this evening to be speaking with you all. So I will just get my slides going and we'll take it from there. Okay, so those have loaded. So as you all know, uh, today is World Wetlands Day. It's February 2nd of 2022. And if you go to uh, the UN's website or the worldwetlandsday.org website, you will see some of the, the wonderful imagery that you saw earlier, as well as what's presented here. And they have this um, motto or, or slogan for the day. And this is actually the first day um, 
uh, I guess in, in Wetlands Day history, where it's actually an official uh, recognized international day by the United Nations and its institutions. Um, and so they have this motto or slogan, and it says, value, manage, restore, love. And in that order. And as I was looking at that slogan, it kind of felt out of order. It felt like maybe some of the crises that we see in the context of wetlands, as were mentioned earlier in terms of their decline, et cetera, might actually have something to do with how we order things, such as this slogan. Why do we place love at the end? This fundamental principle that really is a guiding factor of our morality and ethics as human beings in society, perhaps maybe that should be the first orientation to wetlands and not the last. So that's a bit of a teaser to our conversation today and where I would love to take us, uh, play on the word love there, that we really start to think about our orientation to wetlands, not solely as learning to value them, then learning to manage them, then restoring them. And once they're beautiful and fantastic and healthy and revived and have having all of these aspects of biodiversity that we know we need for planetary health, that then we love them. What if our orientation was completely flipped and we recognize first that love, and oriented ourselves in terms of our obligations and responsibilities as human beings to the natural world around love, around that principle. And from that love would emanate our obligations to restore. And based on that restoration, we would find new pathways of innovation towards management. And in those new innovative ways of managing wetlands, we would come to learn their true value. And the reason I have this positional orientation of beginning with the principle of love, I think does stem a bit from myself being an indigenous scholar and being a researcher uh, now based at the University of Waterloo, but originally from where you see here now on the map of the Shinnecock Nation on the east end of Long Island in New York. And this whole eastern portion of Long Island is our traditional ancestral territories. But you can see where our current uh, reservation reserve is located. We are on a peninsula that juts out into Shinnecock Bay. And on the other side, uh, we, are, um, we have a barrier island that separates us from the Atlantic Ocean. And so surrounding our territory are wetlands. Surrounding all of Long Island is wetlands. We sort of started that uh, the conversation today uh, with an introduction of wetlands being where, where water meets land. Um, and that's also how we understand ourselves as Shinnecock people, because in our language, Shinnecock means people of the shore, people of that place where water meets land. And so that's very foundational and fundamental to how I orient myself and position myself as a scientist, but also how I think about the importance of wetlands being from a coastal First Nation. And so when I think about the importance of wetlands, this orientation around a principle of love is embedded within my core because there is so much to be grateful for in the context of wetlands. There is so much to recognize in that relation and in that relationality to wetlands that allows for me to express an understanding of the principle of love. And so right now you may be asking yourselves, well, I, I, don't, I don't really know, understand what she's saying, or I don't really maybe follow what she's saying. Well, let me explain it to you in the context of climate change. As you're seeing here on the map now, uh, this is a satellite image taken recently through uh, NOAA's uh, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration in the United States Sea Level Rise Simulator. This is a portion of our current uh, reserve reservation territory, as I mentioned, that is the peninsula. We call it the Shinnecock Neck. Um, it's, it's the main land base that we have for our territory and for our population as a First Nation. Um, and But what we are seeing is the potential due to sea level rise in the next um, 50 to 100 years 
that we could lose close to two thirds of our reservation to inundation by rising sea level. And it's not just us, we're not just, you know, existing in some isolated bubble. This is around the world, but particularly also along the Eastern Atlantic of the United States and Canada, where we will be uh, particularly impacted by rising sea levels. But one of the greatest ways in which we have been able to protect ourselves as Indigenous peoples along the Atlantic coast and to thrive is because of wetlands, because of these beautiful blue carbon ecosystems that protect us from storm surge, that allow for us to have a richness of biodiversity to maintain our cultural integrity, our political integrity, our ability to maintain cultural practices from hunting and fishing, um, particularly around shellfishing and these estuarian environments. And so when I started off this conversation, I said I had this foundational understanding of the principle of love towards wetlands because wetlands have made it uh, particularly these salt, salt marsh tidal wetlands around my community, they've enabled us to thrive. Their love for us has enabled us to continue to be here to today, for, till today. And if we think about the future, the, for future generations, for the continuity of our nation, we know that that principle of love that extension of our obligation and responsibility and recognition of that relationality founded on love that the wetlands have shown us, if we return that, it becomes a, a synergetic, symbiotic value and managing. We don't restore, value, manage the wetlands. We love the wetlands. And in that relationality, we come to understand that our futurity is tied together. And so if you maybe haven't been to Long Island or the Eastern Seaboard, you may be somewhat unfamiliar with what these locations and places look like. Uh, this is, is one example along Shinnecock Bay of some of our, our wetland communities and salt marshes. But you can start to see the picture of this beautiful place and space. In that beauty, I think when, when we say that things are beautiful, we say that they are, they inspire love within us. They, they, they rise that emotion within us. And so that is also imperative to how we think about restoration, management, valuing. We can't even get to those principles until we start to understand what it means to be in relation with wetlands, what it means to connect to wetlands, what it means to not seek any benefit from wetlands other than to be thrilled by their persistence of existence. And there are many ways in which this is already occurring around the world. And I think World Wetlands Day is a prime example of how the global community is starting to move in this direction of learning to love and restore connection to the natural world, inclusive of wetlands. Uh, Martha Rojas Urego, the Secretary General of the Convention on Wetlands has said that the wise and sustainable use of wetlands is not only possible, it's critical to the future of humanity and the planet. Continued harm to these life-sustaining ecosystems will have dire consequences if we don't act now. In many ways, wetlands are our lifeline to the future, and we must make the necessary investments of time, capital, and heart to save them. So when we think about what are some of the drivers of wetlands loss and degradation, we note that sustainable use of wetlands requires an understanding of these drivers and, some of the, and how some of the root causes can be addressed. So we note that these drivers include draining and infilling, over extraction of water, pollution, overfishing, climate change. Do you see a common theme running through these drivers? 
if you don't already, for me, it's humans. A lot of these drivers of wetland loss and degradation are human induced. We are having the greatest impact on the decline of wetlands. And I might argue that that decline, that degradation, that lack of care is due to our inability to understand the principle of love as a foundation to environmental conservation. And there are other scholars, uh, scholars like Dr. Deb McGregor out of York University or scholars like Dr. John Burroughs, an indigenous legal scholar, both uh, Anishinaabe. And they speak about this principle of love within the context of Anishinaabe law, within the context of natural law. In Anishinaabe Moan, it's called the Godwin. And they note that this principles of love is inherent to natural law, is inherent to the functioning of indigenous legal systems, particularly Anishinaabe legal systems. But somehow, we don't seem to integrate that into Western law. We seem to maybe have forgotten how to love. We tend to know how to love each other, we search, out, we search out love within our own lives as human beings, but we often relegate that love to only an experience that can be human to human. Or potentially we might have the extension of that love to a family pet. But what does it truly mean if we extended these notions of love to the natural world? If we embraced indigenous law, to the understanding that love is a foundational principle of law. We often get wrapped up in questions of objectivity that, oh, you can't have love because that somehow muddles the waters of objectivity, Lady Liberty and her blindness. But when we think of Lady Liberty, Lady Justice and, and, and their blindness, perhaps they are missing out on some of the key foundations of what it means to be human. To be born onto this planet, not to be entitled to the natural world, but to be born in understanding that you, through that gift, have a responsibility to protect the natural world, to love the natural world. And throughout your life, to steward that relationship, to have your love grow, what could that look like? How might that reform our international conservation practices? If we turn to the work of Dr. Robin Wall Kimmer, another Anishinaabe scholar, she notes that knowing that you love the earth changes you. It activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that the earth loves you in return, that feeling transforms the relationship from a one-way street into a sacred bond. And perhaps that's where we need to be going. Obviously what we're doing right now isn't necessarily working. We are still seeing our wetlands in mass decline. We are still seeing some of the greatest losses of biodiversity in wetlands than we have in previous decades. So if the status quo isn't working, then maybe it's important to try something new or reclaim something old, to reposition and redistribute power so that indigenous law and indigenous peoples can be leaders in these spaces, and they already are. But to champion these ideologies, to be advocates at both across multiple scales, at individual scales, at regional scales, from your townships to your national governments to say, we can restructure in such a way that we position love as foundational to conservation. And so with that, I encourage us to do away with those first three actions of valuing, manage, and restoring. We'll get to those. 
but we can't do them authentically until we learn to love again. We learn to love nature. We learn to restore that connection that enables us to have a bond that is reciprocal, that is a practice of our relationality through responsibility and respect and reciprocity. And in those processes, our love will grow. And through that, we have mechanisms by which we can put forward restoration initiatives. We can put forward new management and we can actually learn to value nature for nature and not for what it can give us. And if you're asking yourselves, well, how do we do this? That, that, that sounds nice. I, I think I could get behind that. Well, it's already happening. And like I said, it's not necessarily a new initiative but perhaps a reclaiming of diverse scientific traditions that we've already had existing on the planet for millennia. But because of colonialism and other isms and systemic injustice, those were pushed aside. But we have a unique opportunity, given our current and existing climate crisis, to reclaim a position within the law that allows for us to support a reciprocal relationship based on love with nature. And that's through what some call earth law or earth jurisprudence, or you might've heard of it in terms of rights of nature. But earth law says that we need to recognize, honor and protect nature's inherent rights to exist, thrive and evolve. And ultimately the hope of this specific aspect of, of legal initiatives is a future in which humans and nature flourish together. Where my existence as a Shinnecock woman is tied to the existence of our salt marshes. And I know that. And I know that the futurity of my grandchildren and great grandchildren and their children's children is connected to that reciprocal relationship based in love. And we can embed that within our legal systems. It's already happening. It's a global movement. We see constitutional amendments that have been passed. We see court decisions and amicus briefs and different ways in which litigation and these public forums are being utilized to set precedent and reshape the law as we know it today. And we also see grassroots activism. We see from local municipalities and townships and villages to uh, states and provinces, and even national governments working to create new law that solidifies the rights of nature to exist, flourish, and thrive. And many of these initiatives are also indigenous led and they are being enacted by indigenous governments and indigenous peoples and they are leading this movement to, for nature in many ways, to reclaim its rightful place within our society that we as humans are a part of the environment. We are not the sole beneficiaries. And so we see that we've had instances of these types of initiatives being passed in Mexico, in the United States, in Colombia, Uganda, India, Bangladesh, Ecuador, Bolivia, New Zealand, New Caledonia. New initiatives are passed every day and they're captured currently uh, through a UN initiative called the UN Harmony with Nature program. So if you're wanting to learn more, you can go there. But you may have heard one of the sort of more recent uh, initiatives, like the recognition of the inherent rights of the Whanganui River in Aotearoa, New Zealand, a collaborative initiative between the national government and uh, the Maori iwi community. And so, when we think about the potential of that recognition of that river, the acknowledgement of its inherent rights to exist, thrive and naturally evolve, we start to see more of these initiatives emerge. And perhaps we start to plant a seed of the way in which it could come to fruition for wetlands. And it's already started. We've had our first river recognized within Canada. Uh, the Magpie River was recently recognized last year uh, through a joint initiative of the Innu First Nation and a local municipality within Quebec. It's the first river in Canada to receive uh, these types of rights and recognition through a co-governance arrangement as well. 
um, acknowledging that as Indigenous peoples and many First Nations across the uh, territory now known as Canada have had these types of relationships of recognition of the legal personality of rivers and other natural entities for hundreds of years, if not millennia. But this is the first time where we're starting to see it recognized within Western law in Canada, recognized in a co-governance arrangement between First Nations and a non-Indigenous government body. And so we're hopeful that more of these types of initiatives can take place. And what might that look like? Well, in the context of wetlands, we also know that where we, many of us are zooming in from today uh, in uh, the sort of Great Lakes region, and it, as was noted in the land acknowledgement earlier, the University of Waterloo is on uh, the traditional territory of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, as well as other indigenous peoples. And we know that the Great Lakes are known for their wild rice, known for monomen. Uh, it's a cultural, species of great importance to Anishinaabek peoples throughout the Great Lakes region. And it is directly connected to the beautiful wetland habitats that we have here. Um, and so I wanted to share this with you of a way in which we start to see the principle of love be enacted through earth law and the recognition of rights of nature in one particular instance of wetland habitats in the Great Lakes through the recognition of the rights of the nomen. And this happened recently, I believe it was in 2017, uh, and that was done by the White Earth Ojibwe Nation. Uh, they are a tribal nation uh, located on um, sort of the U.S. side of the imagined border, if we'll call it that. But their traditional territory is the Great Lakes Basin, and they passed a law within their tribal jurisdiction that recognizes the rights of Monomen. And they're now using that law, the recognizing that monoma and wild rice has the right to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve. And they're now using that law to defend the rights of monoma um, against uh, any type of infraction that would jeopardize its rights to exist. Um, one, one instance is through the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources um, in its pursuit to continue to advance different types of pipeline proliferation. When we think about the um, aspects of energy justice in our basin and in our region, we also have to ask questions about the way in which our energy profile jeopardizes wetlands, jeopardizes the species that depend on these ecosystems like wild rice. And so this is just one example of an indigenous nation using these types of legal mechanisms in our contemporary legal systems to affirm their inherent principle of love within the law for the protection of wild rice. And they're not alone. This is a part, as I mentioned earlier, of an international movement. Uh, through the Society of Wetland Scientists, there were a group of some of the most uh, prominent and preeminent wetland scientists around the world, um, as well as climate scientists who have come together and actually put forward the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Wetlands. Now, right now, it's just a grassroots movement. They're encouraging people to sign on, for organizations to sign on, to use the declaration in the ways in which they approach their understanding of conservation towards wetlands. And you can find out more by going to the rightsofwetlands.org. But I wanted to highlight for you the way in which we can start to think about our relationship to wetlands differently. What would it look like if we actually lived the principle of love in our enactment of protection towards wetlands? Well, it might look like this declaration, which declares that all wetlands are entities entitled to inherent and enduring rights which derive from their existence as members of the earth community and should possess legal standing in courts of law. These inherent rights include following the right to exist, the right to their ecologically determined location in the landscape, the right to natural connected and sustainable hydrological regimes, the right to ecologically sustainable climatic conditions, the right to have naturally occurring biodiversity free of introduced or invasive species that disrupt their ecological integrity, the right to integrity of structure, function, evolutionary processes, and the ability to fulfill natural ecological roles in the earth's processes, and also the right to be free from pollution the, and degradation. And lastly, the right to regeneration and restoration. If we 
think about these rights, we sometimes get asked, okay, well, th this sounds acceptable. This sounds like something I can get behind, but who speaks for the wetlands? How do we actually implement these ideas and, and, and rights? Well, really, it has to be localized and context dependent. We need to put in the work as local communities, as citizens of our societies, to not only build out these principles of rights and embed them within the law, but then to also build out the processes and structures by which they can be enforced and to co-determine who should speak, whether as individuals or collectives, for the rights of weapons. It's going to look different all around the planet. As I showed you earlier in the context of this global movement, the form of operationalization of rights of nature movements looks different across all different waterscapes and landscapes, and it should, in large part because there's no universal wetland. Each wetland is different. It has a different history, a different context, a different grouping of peoples who are in relationship with that wetland. And the history of love and the foundation of that relationship will look different from wetland to wetland. And so this is just the starting point, not the end point for how we begin to build love into the conservation ethic for wetlands. And I hope in future World Wetlands Days, we're not talking about the theoretical potential of these rights existing, but we're actually working towards ways in which we, they are being implemented to restore, manage, value, because we've already acknowledged, accepted, and built a foundation based on love. So Tabutni, thank you. Uh, this is my contact information if you'd like to continue the conversation further offline, uh, but I welcome your questions. Thanks so much. That was super fascinating and thought provoking. And as someone who really does love wetlands, it was, you know, it, it was great to, to think about, uh, you know, a lot of the ways that I talk about them, you know, would, wouldn't necessarily position love first. So, so thanks for that. Um, so if anyone from um, the audience has questions, uh, remember you can put them in the question and answer uh, feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, while we're waiting, uh, Kelsey, for, for some questions to come in, I, I will start us off. Um, at the end, you were, you were talking about, you know, who would speak for the wetlands. And, and, I, and I think, you know, if we wanna have maybe more people who are really excited to speak for the wetlands, it, it probably requires that people feel that connection and feel that love. So what are some ways in which we can maybe help others have that, that stronger connection to wetlands? Thank you so much for that question. And I think one of the first steps in connecting with nature is actually being in nature. So I think having more land-based education, more wetland-based education is a great opportunity for us to build as a society greater connection to wetlands. And that also has to start very young. I think sometimes we, we build out this idea of, of field courses, of interactions with wetlands as something that can only happen um, at sort of a university level or in, in higher education. But if we start to build those connections earlier on in life, um, think about the ways in which that might transform a student's perspective on the world and on how they understand these foundational ethics of what it means to be a human being, like love, um, to be able to teach them early on that that is something that can be practiced with nature is really important to their evolutionary development, to their brain development, um, just to the form, the opportunity to form those young minds. I think it's important to think about how we do that at an early stage. Yeah, thanks for that. And I guess even, you know, probably us having, using those words in our own conversation will probably help to translate to, to kids as they're sort of developing, you know, um, great. Um, another 
uh, okay, a question here. Um, oh, that, yeah, sorry, that was another question we're gonna answer from one of the other panelists. But so in many parts of the world, um, people living in and around wetlands are marginalized um, or they have sort of uh, the political power relationships may play a really important role in how the rights of nature what might be implemented. So it might be hard for the people that might be able to speak for the wetlands maybe to have that, to be in a position of power to, to have their voices heard. Um, so how do we overcome those barriers? Oh, that is a wonderful question. Um, I think the answer is, is a testament to what we've seen done historically, which is grassroots activism, which is um, finding pathways to be heard, um, whether that be through, uh, through speech and through um, marches and uh, really sort of building conversation um, out in the streets. And, and, and maybe it's building conversation at your kitchen table is sort of where a lot of movements start um, and movement building occurs. And, and I think that's what we're seeing right now. Um, I definitely am familiar with power structures and, and the way in which living, um, if, you, if you didn't catch on, the, uh, my reserve and, and home territory is surrounded by the Hamptons. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that the type of relationship that our Hamptons neighbors who live there seasonally is not always an extension of love. Um, they, they love their homes, they love having waterfront, but it's not necessarily a love to, towards the wetlands. Oftentimes it's actually an adversarial uh, relationship towards wetlands because it's seen as obstructing their view or obstructing their access. And again, it's, it's sort of based on this superiority complex that humans should be the sole beneficiary of, of wetlands and of what they uh, provide for the Earth's planetary system. And so I think when we think about power structures, you, how do we push back against that? We just push back. You just, it, you have to be out. You have to be, you have to be speaking your truth um, and you have to, you know, try and raise awareness in the forums that you can. Today is, is one opportunity, you know, raising consciousness through World Wetlands Day is definitely um, an opportunity to continue to push these conversations forward. And just think, this is the first day where, uh, first year in which World Wetlands Day is actually officially, you know, an international day of the UN. So from year to year, we do start to see change because there are people behind the scenes pushing for these initiatives and hopefully that will continue. Yeah, fantastic. Um... When you think about pushing this work forward that, that you were talking about today, what do you, what's the most exciting for you? Sort of what's on the horizon that really excites you? Oh, I think what really excites me, it's, it's, it's maybe probably what wouldn't excite people normally, but I think the the heaviness of our climate crisis is actually pushing people to a point where they have to listen. I think before they, it, it wasn't in their backyard, it wasn't at their front door, they, they didn't really you know, understand an extreme climate event, they hadn't really experienced one. So it just felt like, oh, you're just, you know, you're just those people over there making a lot of noise. But now I think the climate crisis, the types of extreme events that are rippling out because of this crisis are, are touching everyone. And, and now everyone has some form of, of ability to relate to the crisis. And because of that, we're able to have more of these conversations. We're able to talk about the way in which salt marshes and wetlands are blue carbon ecosystems that are able to be a nature-based solution. And not a nature-based solution that we can trade off through economic incentives, but actually a nature-based solution where we can witness nature's beauty and love for us and be able to help it along its way. Because we also have this superiority complex of we think we know better, but oftentimes nature knows more than we do. And if we took the time to pause and witness and observe and learn how nature is responding to this crisis, we might have more pathways of innovation than we even thought of before. Yeah, so sort of like, yeah, being excited maybe about disaster might not be the best, but you know, yeah, I get what you're saying, right? It, it brought it into sort of mainstream discussion into the media and 
more and more people are excited about, not excited about climate change, but excited about the opportunities and, and working with, you know, yeah, appreciating and, and working with nature to, uh, as an ally. And, and Zoe Todd and Heather, Heather Davis, they, they have a piece about dating the Anthropocene and, and they talk about this and, and others do too, that as indigenous peoples, we've already gone through our apocalypse, maybe multiple apocalypses, because we've gone through colonialism and are going through it and have gone through genocide. And, you know, my community has lived on the east end of Long Island for thousands of years, and we've been through 400 years of, of colonialism and more. And, and so the excitement of disaster is a little bit, it's an excitement that, well, maybe they'll listen now. Maybe they'll, they'll hear us. Maybe it's an opportunity for us to, to see a shift to get to a new age where we can do away with human activity being the greatest impact on Earth's changes. Uh, maybe we can move away from the Anthropocene to something better. Um, so I guess it's, it's a bit of acceptance that in our history of, of facing apocalypse, we know that it also allows for rebirth. And that's also very much connected to how we understand love mm. as human beings and as societies. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, I'm going to ask. I, I have a, a great question in in the in the um, Q and A, but I, it actually ties really closely to the panel discussion. So I think I'm going to save okay. it for that, to not to preempt too much. But I have sort of a, a very should be a relatively quick question about. Um, I think this came up when you were talking about um, sort of the, your neighbors in in the Hamptons, and and just kind of a practical question about. You know, do you think that coastal urban development might be an a greater threat uh, than sea level rise to coastal marshes or vice versa, or maybe it's a bit of both. Okay, so coastal urban development has been probably maybe 50 years ago was, was the greater threat. Um, and now it's sort of, it's pick, you know, pick one. <laughs> it's all coming into Everything. a perfect storm. Um, you know, and, and I say that because, you know, our, our elders would always say, we're surprised the island hasn't sunk because of how much urban sprawl, urban development was happening, pushing out all the way to the East End, particularly even in the context of the Hamptons and vacation homes and second homes. And then um, with COVID, we had sort of the second home flight escapism uh, that happened from those who were in New York City and confined in tight spaces and said, I'm getting out of here. I don't, I don't wanna catch COVID. And then they moved out um, to their to their second homes and made those their permanent homes. Um, and so urban development has is, is always been a challenge in the past hundred years on, on the island. Um, and likely it will continue to be as we start to see more of these climatic pressures um, add additional compounded stressors. Uh, I just wish the urban development question, it, we still need to address it. I wish we would have addressed it 50 years ago. And, um, and I wish it wasn't a question of urban development for the poor. It needs to be urban development for the rich. Stop building your houses that you don't even live in for most of the year. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, and yeah, a lot of interconnected issues going on, right? Like a lot of complicated uh, questions there. Well, thanks so much for uh, that great talk, as well as uh, all your your uh, answers to to those questions. And um, we're going to turn over to the panel now. Um, the topic of our panel is conserving nature, exploring value systems, and I'm I'm really excited for this. Um, I myself also spend a lot of time in wetlands and thinking about their wise use and and how to value them. So I'm I'm really thrilled to to have this exciting uh, panel tonight that represents different parts of environmental research, management from academia, government, and conservation. So I'll start first by introducing our panelists, um, then they'll each have a few minutes to tell you a little bit more about themselves and um, their thoughts on our panel topic tonight. And uh, then we'll also have a 15 minute uh, for further discussion with the panelists and, um, so, and to answer questions that you might have. So if you do have questions for the panelists, further questions for Dr. Leonard that you, you thought of or that come up when you hear the panelists speak, feel free to put those in the Q&A throughout and, and we'll um, arrange those and pass them on to the panelists as we have time. Um, so our first panelist tonight is Heather Crochet-Chair. Um, Heather is a senior specialist in ecosystem restoration at the World Wildlife Fund Canada. 
She holds a master's of environment from the University of Waterloo. And she's also on the board of directors of the North American Native Plant Society. Our next panelist is the Honorable Mike Morris, who is the MP for Kitchener Center and is one of two Green Party MPs currently in the House of Commons at the federal level. He was elected to this position in October of 2021. And prior to this, he founded Sustainable Waterloo Region and Green Economy Canada. We're also pleased to have Jenna Quinn with us tonight. Uh, Jenna is the program specialist at RARE, a charitable research reserve uh, locally here in Waterloo Region, and she oversees the research and monitoring department. Uh, Jenna holds a master's of science in biology and a master of education. And then we're uh, really pleased that Dr. Leonard can also join us for this uh, panel discussion. Um, so like I said, I'll, each of the panelists will now have a couple of minutes to speak to you, and we're going to start with uh, Heather. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging I'm joining from Toronto tonight. So the land I'm joining from is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Uh, I've worked in the conservation field for 10 years now, actually starting at WWF Canada very shortly after I completed my master's from the University of Waterloo. So it's really exciting for me to be here with this group, at least virtually. Uh, and I joined the board of the North American Native Plant Society, or as we like to call it, NAMPS, uh, this past year. And it's been a really fascinating journey for me to get to see how a smaller organization works compared to a larger organization like WWF Canada. Um, in my personal life, I live in Toronto with my partners and my two cats who have become quite the Zoom stars over the past couple of years, as I'm sure many of us with pets can relate to. Um, so... Moving into the question about valuing nature for its intrinsic value or for its economic value. Uh, first, I really wanted to thank Dr. Leonard for your talk tonight. Uh, really, that really resonated with me quite a lot. Um, when we think about the question of conserving nature for its intrinsic versus economic value, I think we start to get into trouble when we position ourselves as separate from nature and in a place in a place to assess its value. Um, we and all of our systems, including our economic systems, exist within nature, not the other way around. So it's easy for, to forget that sometimes, especially for those of us who live in really urbanized environments. I know I've heard stories of people, when you ask them where their water come from, comes from, they save the tap. Like they actually don't realize that it comes from a body of water. Um, so, and, but I actually just saw a study that was published last year in ecological economics that found that increased species diversity, and in this study it was actually bird diversity, had an impact of reported feelings of well being at a similar magnitude to an increased income. And it's the same reason why many of us feel so recharged after spending time in nature. We are nature. And so, you know, Rach, nature absolutely has a right to exist just like we do. So I'm definitely in the camp of conserving nature for its intrinsic value. Um, but it is also a question of self-preservation. If we fail to preserve nature, we fail to conserve our home. And yeah, there are economic implications to that. But first and foremost, we need to respect the intrinsic value of nature. I'll leave it there for now. Yeah. Thanks so much, Heather. I think this will be a, a great discussion as we go along. Um, so I'll pass it uh, next over to Mike. Maria, thank you. Yeah, and, and we can uh, hear you well, so good. Oh, good, great. Uh, well, lovely to be uh, with you all this evening. Um, I'm actually speaking with you tonight uh, from what is today known as Ottawa, the uh, unceded territory of the Algonquin. And, um, I'll just, you know what, you've had the wisdom we've heard from Dr. Leonard and Heather as well already. I think what I'd like to do is just spend the few minutes I've got to share with you some ideas in terms of uh, bringing to action some of what you heard from Dr. Dr. Leonard. Uh, specifically, you know, when we think about nature in terms of that interdependence uh, that you've heard throughout the evening and the sense of two-way love and the rights to a healthy environment and, and the rights of 
of natural bodies of water. Um, I want folks to know that there has been ad advocacy um, over the last number of years. Uh, in particular, the David Suzuki Foundation uh, has been really pushing a, cam a campaign to enshrine um, uh, the rights to a healthy environment uh, in, in federal legislation. And I'd actually love to hear what Dr. Leonard, what you think of it, if we have time for that in, in, in the panel discussion, uh, I'd love to hear your insights. Um, but this has been a campaign that's been ongoing. You know, Canadians across the country have been pushing. We've had mi municipalities uh, that have endorsed it. Um, and over time, uh, more and more pressure on the governing party to take action. And there's actually a piece of legislation uh, that has been proposed uh, by an NDP member, uh, Richard Cannings, uh, to restart the process again in a, in a private member's bill. And so if I have the ability in the chat, I do. I'll, I'll put a link to the bill. Um, a number of us have already seconded it. And because Richard is early enough in this session, there's a good chance that we could make a lot of progress on it before another election is called. Um, and so in terms of like offering some places for hope of, you know, where could we take these conversations from the streets and enshrine them in legislation in ways that could uh, really shift um, the, well, <laughs> the rights uh, of nature for its inherent uh, intrinsic val uh, value. Uh, that is, I think, one way. And there should be a lot of ways to put pressure with respect to that bill uh, over the coming months, that might be a way for folks to engage. Um, so I think I'll pause there. Uh, and if there's other ways that folks want to hear from me over the course of the panel, happy to uh, to add more there too. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Mike. And yeah, I'm sure that um, people would be probably interested to to see more if you want to put that in the chat for the uh, general audience so they can can see that link. That sounds great. Uh, Jenna, I'll pass it to you next. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so pleased to join everyone tonight. And thank you, Dr. Leonard. That was an amazing talk. Um, so many things I was jotting down and just um, looking forward to diving in more uh, with this panel. Um, I'll start by saying I'm joining from my home in Kitchener, which is also on the Haldeman tract. So um, thank you for the land acknowledgement to start us off today. And I also offer my gratitude to the original stewards of the land that I feel very fortunate to live, work and play on. Um, as mentioned, I'm the program scientist at the Rare Charitable Research Reserve, which is a land trust and environmental institute located in Waterloo and Wellington with a focus on conservation, research and education. So a big part of what I do, perhaps the biggest part of my job at RARE is really about supporting other people who are um, coming to RARE to, um, for, their, for their research, for their art, um, knowledge keepers, other land users that are, are visiting RARE to partner with us or um, partner with the land. <laughs> and I get the um, amazing pleasure of really supporting everyone with these unique projects. Um, and so I'll just, give a little bit of a pitch and say, if you have a project, if you um, want to reach out and learn more, I'm always happy to hear from people and to just go out for a walk and see, see the land and, and talk about what you're working on and how we may be able to support you and work together. Uh, and we also have funding available for graduate students who um, have projects that are taking place at Rare or with Rare. And so always exciting part of my job to be able to give away some money to some well-deserving uh, people. Uh, at Rare, our goal is to steward conservation land for the community and future generations. And we do this through a myriad of ways, really trying to support people who are finding their connection with nature how, however that may be. And I'm a, a scientist that was trained at um, university. And when I graduated with that degree, I came out um, thinking I knew how to protect um, the planet and I, I knew the right way to do it. And I'm really fortunate to have worked at Rare for nearly 10 years now where that thinking in, in me and in us as an, as an organization has been able to evolve. And I've been able to um, find new joys through new avenues that I didn't really um, knew, know uh, could exist within me. And um, 
really, especially being able to explore nature through art, which as a scientist, I hadn't really um, done before. So lots of really great ways to connect with the land. And I'm always looking to talk about new ways to connect with the land and help people um, find that connection for themselves. Uh, nature is really important to me. It's a big part of my life. Uh, obviously, my job is centered around nature, most of my hobbies. Um, and I think especially during the pandemic, we likely all realized uh, maybe a newfound or rediscovered relationship with nature, uh, socializing with my friends and family. That's largely been done outdoors, I'm sure like many of you, always looking to go for a hike or maybe gather around a campfire and go to a patio and finding safe ways to stay connected. And um, similarly, it's also been my escape for alone time. A lot of us have been in our house with the people we live with all the time. And so rediscovering that connection with nature in terms of uh, having that inner peace and being able to recenter myself by spending time outdoors. Um, so I'm sure that's something many people can relate to that has been experienced over the last couple of years. And I hope we can take that with us moving forward and um, really think about how it's our responsibility to you know, leave behind a better place than, than we arrived. And that conservation is just really one pathway to that goal. Um, so looking forward to talking more with everyone and I'll leave it there for now. Thanks a lot, Jenna. And um, Kelsey, do you have uh, some thoughts you wanna add? And I think a couple of the other panelists had, had a couple sort of thoughts for you. So I, yeah, I'll, whatever you, you, you wanna say now. Oh, I think, yeah, this has been great. And I'm so excited to dive into the additional questions with the panelists. It's really a pleasure to be with you all. And I don't I don't think I have uh, additional thoughts right now. Um, very keen to, to dive deeper into the conversation about the legislation. Um, I, I, I could do that all, all day. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, more legislation is better than, than less legislation um, in these contexts as we try to think about ways to protect nature. So um, yeah, excited to, to talk more about that. Thanks. Okay, well, I, I have a, a really uh, good question that, that came in here and, and that I think, you know, was maybe originally to you, uh, Kelsey, but, but actually, it would be great to hear everyone's um, ideas from the panel. And, um, you know, when we think back to, uh, to your talk, uh, Dr. Leonard, about the love of nature, uh, this question is saying that, you know, that's, that's important. And, and actually, a lot of us here today probably really feel that quite strongly. But you might think of, of speaking to the converted in this audience, and, and you might really not get that buy-in from, from it everyone or maybe the broader community. So um, if we think back also to the start of the presentation tonight, there was discussion of a paper that had um, calculated that the Ontario wetlands might provide $4 billion in ecosystem services. So do you think that talking about that economic value might be a way to get more buy-in for conservation um, with maybe the, the non yet converted nature lovers? And maybe I'll ask you first, Kelsey, but I'm interested for, for sort of everyone's uh, thoughts on this. Yeah, that is the, the Pandora's box, right? <laughs> Where, how, do we, how do we set a value for nature? And I think even before asking that question, it's it, it, the better question might be, should we? Which is really what you pose to us. Should we be setting a value on nature? Um, I think there, I think what that paper says is actually something different than valuing nature for its ecosystem services. I think it says, let's value you know, tax dollars so that they're not going to remediate something that could have been avoided if we actually listened to nature, loved nature, and reordered those system processes, as I mentioned to start. If we begin with love, then the restoration, the management, and the valuing will flow naturally from there. But if you start, with ecosystem services and only what they can provide as an economic value to me, then you just be you, you're just feeding the hamster wheel, 
And I don't think it's I don't think it's productive and I don't think it's going to actually get us to where we want to be in 30 years, 100 years where we're not facing some of these dire dr drastic declines in biodiversity and wetland loss. So um, so do I think that the the paper is is wrong? No, I think the paper is trying to highlight for us if we listen to nature, if we follow what nature knows itself to do um, and learn from it we actually could save ourselves a lot of turmoil and a lot of money in the process. And really that money is money that we as tax dollars could be putting to other systemic injustices and redistributing to mental health, to violence against women, to all of these other things that are also human induced. Um, and, and so I think those are, those are some of my thoughts to start, but I'd love to hear what the other panelists have to share. Yeah. Does anyone else want to jump in on this? Yeah, happy to jump yeah. in. Um, I loved everything you just said, Dr. Leonard, um, the reframe of it's not, you know, this is the value of the ecosystem. This is what we would lose if we lost it. And and I I think that when we put dollar values on nature, it can be a very compelling communications tool, but that would be, you see that as a communications tool rather than truly nature equals this dollar value, um, because that can, you know, reducing nature to a line on a budget can be a slippery slope. Um, but to the, to the point of the person who asked the question, when we're talking to people that might not approach it from the same perspective as us, it can be a good way to kind of bridge that gap and make people understand that we stand to lose quite a bit if we don't lead with love and, and make sure that nature is cared for. Yeah, I really agree. Um, I think that it's important to remember people relate to information in different ways. So, um, and, and it's a reality that there's been a disconnection between people and land. So it is a tool that can be, um, like Heather said, a really effective communication piece. And in, in certain situations, it can kind of meet people where they're at. If you're talking about, um, you know, paving a wetland to build a mall and the numbers are being thrown at you, it's going to create this many jobs and um, create this much revenue. And then you can use this as a counter argument that, to that. You can say, hang on, let's make sure we're putting the real value on the other side of the scale as well. So, so that can be definitely important. Um, and I think as well, especially when we're talking to the people who make the policy decisions, and maybe Mike, you can speak more to this, but obviously the elected leaders are not experts in every single field um, that is you know, important to know about, and they're relying on people to give them information to, so they can make informed decisions. Um, and so I think that I might be able to say to you, you know, this wetland has this amount of insect biomass and that, you know, is available prey for an intricate food web, or I might be able to tell you the, you know, grams of phosphorus that were filtered out of the water because of this wetland, but that might not really mean anything to you. And so putting a dollar number to it can sort of bring it to a standard scale that most people understand. And, and that can be important, but it is very important to remember that context is key. And if you're just putting that information out into the world, then you're really missing um, a big part. And I think if you're giving that information, it's also important that you're weighing your own biases about how you might value that and how the people you're giving that information to might value it as well. So um, it's certainly one tool in the tool book, uh, not the only one. And I think that we have to be really careful to have an over-reliance on um, economic valuations because they can really just deepen the divide between us and nature, like many people have said here today. And we don't want to do that. <laughs> we want to try to be bringing people together. And also remember that not everything can be summed up onto a monetary scale. So there's lots of uh, value, like Dr. Leonard was talking about relational value in a wetland that just can't have a price tag put on it. And so um, really we should be saying that our wetlands are priceless <laughs> um, and 
they're supporting our like life supporting services that keep us here. So how could we really say what that's worth? Um, and, and important to remember that they're irreplaceable. So very important to, to stress as Dr. Leonard did, this is not the amount the wetland is worth. This is the, um, the service, the value of the service it's providing. And, um, it cannot be rebuilt once it's lost. Those are um, important pieces of information to remember in the discussion, I think. Great points, Jenna. I think Mike wanted to jump in, so I... Uh, it's a real honor to be part of this conversation. Thanks so much for asking me to be a part of it. Um, I'll just go maybe a bit further. Uh, what we were hearing from Dr. Leonard and Jenna and Heather earlier is not simply a perspective, it's a fact uh, that humans are living in interdependence with the biosphere and with all other living species. Some people might not be as aware of that fact as others. And so for those folks for whom they're less aware of that fact, this idea that we might try to share the ecology or the economic value, I want to also be mindful there are some real limitations to that. Um, back in 2008, the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy released a report sharing the economic uh, impact of not taking action on climate in the billions and billions of dollars. And while I think 2008 was uh, 14 years ago, and fast forward to this day, and we continue to subsidize fossil fuels, $18 billion a year in the midst of what some claim is a climate emergency, um, that seems unreasonable uh, if we knew about the economic cost uh, back then. So it, that leads me to believe that it's not just the um, valuing the economic cost, but actually making a more heartfelt connection. I'll use a specific example, so it's not philosophical. There's talk of building Highway 413 right through wetlands, right through, uh, it would be a climate disaster. It would lead to the kind of sprawl um, that, um, that, that, that we would never get back. Um, and my sense is if we had more uh, more conversations recognizing not just the economic, but the inherent value uh, of our connection with nature and the interdependence of all living species, ourselves included, um, that that would be a very different conversation. And maybe it's part of where Dr. Leonard, you were also speaking earlier, but how do we, how do we you know, move this into legislation uh, more quickly? Um, and to offer one reflection there is, I would believe it's really important that we have stronger representation of Indigenous voices in legislatures at the municipal, provincial, and federal level. Speaking to my limited experience, having only been elected uh, this past fall, um, and seeing only two voices of Indigenous leaders amongst 338 parliamentarians, you know, those, those two in particular um, the representatives for Winnipeg Center and for uh, Nunavut, the outsized contributions they both have to the quality of the discourse at the federal level across all policy domains, and particularly with respect to climate and with, with respect to uh, the natural environment is, is incredible. And so it makes it maybe a one call to action for folks is you've got two elections coming up this year, both municipal and provincial, and those are really important moments to be um, getting behind individuals who are going to take action um, to, to move towards uh, the kind of love connection that you're hearing from Dr. Leonard earlier um, at a really critical, critical time. Thanks so much, everyone, for your thoughts. Um, I have another question to go to, but just any, any final thoughts on this sort of? I just add one more thought that came up, um, Michael, you were sharing that example. Often when, you know, it's a question of development, the profits to be made by the developer, it's not the same person who's going to be profiting, who's going to have to be paying for the loss of the ecosystem or the same group or organization or, you know, what have you. So it, there are certainly limitations to using the economic argument that it's important to be mindful of. It's not, it's not always so simple as, this, this much money could be made, but this is how much it would cost to replace it because it, there are different organizations that would either profit or not. I think that's a really good point. It's often the, the collective that's gonna pay, right? <laughs> um, so 
this comes back. Uh, this this next question comes back a little bit to to some of the discussion that we were having, Kelsey, um, about sort of that. How do we build that connection? But um, maybe a bit more specific. And you know, the the thought from from this uh, from Bill here is that if we bring this wonder and like and really actually can expose people to wetlands, that the love will follow probably most of the time, unless they really get their boots, you know, get totally dunked in there. But most of the time, I, I, I totally agree. Um, so that it is really important to bring that exposure to, to youth um, and to, you know, the, those that maybe don't have that, that love connection yet. But particularly as we have more and more people living in urban settings, and, that, and those people are probably going to have a really important role in decision making about protection of those you know that are those sites that are going to be the most easily disturbed of really having maybe the power to be voting in a lot of the legislators that that Mike's talking about um, how do we how do we build that connection in those in those places where people may not have a lot of opportunity to actually connect with nature anymore yeah such a, a really great question I mean I think there's definitely space and opportunity in classrooms, no matter where they are in the world, to connect to nature, um, and particularly to connect to wetlands. There's a wonderful program that was uh, started um, out of Thunder Bay by a school teacher named Peter Cameron called the Junior Water Walkers, and it builds off of uh, Indigenous uh, grandmothers who who walked the the Great Lakes, all of them, multiple times, and uh, building off of that knowledge uh, mobilization activity has sort of now transitioned it or translated it to be an activity that can be led um, in, in the classroom, largely for, for elementary age, but um, is expanding into all different types of classrooms. And so they have um, classroom exchanges and there's over a hundred different classrooms around the world where they share their water stories um, and these different experiences. And so I think if they can do that in the context of um, largely fresh water, but they're, they're keeping a more holistic vision of water, something similar could be done for, for wetlands. I also think that um, one of the most profound moments, I think for myself as a you know, young scientist was a piece that National Geographic did um, where they did um, digital restorations of Manhattan um, and what it looked like before um, New York City was, was sort of built. Um, and that many of our major urban in, you know, metropolises are actually built on top of wetlands. So I think if you're going to start to have a conversation about how do you protect wetlands, urban environments are prime, pristine areas to have that conversation because you actually are still living in the wetland. I think we were talking about wetlands declining, yes, and the loss of biodiversity, yes. I don't think the wetland dies. The wetland's still there. It's just, we have erased it from our memory. And I think that's particularly true in the context of urban environments. And so when I think of Manhattan now, I imagine those, those digital restorations. I imagine also now the way in which we have things like um, AI and virtual reality where we could potentially reconstruct um, these these nature scapes in into in these digital platforms to be able to come to know them in a new way and hopefully work towards building love and then restoration there therefrom. So um, just some thoughts. I love that. I mean, I, I yeah, I love that idea of like, can you can you imagine walking around Toronto or, or Waterloo region and seeing what it looked like hundreds of a few hundred years ago? Um, that would be that would be an incredible way to co connect back to me. Yeah. Well, and that's, and we also look to Indigenous place names for that too. You know, you think of the, you know, the name Toronto and, and there's a, a few different um, histories behind the name, but one is that it's a place where trees stand in water. That's, that's a wetland, <laughs> you know? So you're even, you are living in, in a wetland, even if you've erased it from your memory, it hasn't died because that language is still being spoken. That word is still being put out into the universe. It's still there trying to love you, but you're not loving it back. Super powerful thoughts. Are there anyone else want to jump in? Um, yeah, I love that. And uh, it just reminded me of this um, wetland at Rare where um, it was a farm field. This is a field with a hundred plus year legacy of um, farm being farmed. And um, 
so when Rare started stewarding the land, it, it was a farm field and um, in partnership with some research, we planted a tall grass prairie and then this sort of wetland started appearing or actually it appeared before we planted the tall grass prairie. Um, and we had a lot of different people, different experts, um, different knowledge keepers from different um, lenses come in and sort of tell us what's what's going on here. And, and the general idea was that, you know, this is where the water wants to be going. It, it was in a dredged channel, it was tiled, it was, um, you know, barred from going here so that this field could be farmed. And now over a hundred years later, here's the water um, finding its way back to the Grand River in the way that it wants to go. And um, we were able to kind of do our best to listen to that and plan a restoration project around you know where the water is telling us it's its natural path um so i really love that imagery of just like that wetland was never gone you know it was always there waiting for the chance to be able to come back out um and at rare we're really for i'm really fortunate i get to work with young people and see um see the kids really spending time in nature and the impact that that can have uh, I grew up in nature and love nature and still I have this um, really resonating memory and it wasn't until I was in university taking a herpetology class when our professor brought us out into the wetland to put on waders and see the turtles and see the red winged blackbirds and really like experience it and um, I just loved it I can still um, feel the way the wa the waders like cling to your body when the water pressure um, is around them. And uh, there's really nothing like it. And now I have the great joy of being able to take kids out to have that experience as well. Um, and we, we give opportunities for kids to really kind of go through the scientific process in a wetland, some do something like benthic invertebrate monitoring where they get to, you know, put on waders and take a net and collect some sediment and look through it for the bugs and really um, see it that way and tell them how we use that data. But we also make sure to balance that with just time spent there doing nothing as well, just um, sitting and maybe journaling about what you see and hear or um, going back to the exact same spot every day for five days and sitting there and how has that changed and if you sit in silence for you know five minutes ten minutes what will come to you that you wouldn't have seen if you were just walking by so um all of those things are important uh, so sometimes when we're with kids it's like activity 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 keep them busy but sometimes just being there with them is also a good practice now I just want to come and, and sit in the wetland with you, Jenna, for a, a little while. I could use that with the, the busy days we have. Um, Mike, I think you were about to jump in there. I don't know if you want to add something. Well, yeah, I just wanted to make a plug for Rare. Like, what a <laughs> gift. And uh, just my question for anyone with us tonight or watching afterwards, when was the last time you walked a, one, of the, one of Rare's trails? Uh, we have, like, tw I think it's... Jenna will correct me if I'm wrong, 1,200 acres or so, right, of, of conservation land. Um, and it's my sense that our connection, our connection with nature is innate, and we unlearn it over time in urban settings. And so for young people, it's about just cultivating that connection with nature that's already there. And for older folks, about unlearning the disconnection. I think it was Heather who shared like water comes from the tap. Like that is that is a learned thing from living in an urban setting. And, you know, lucky for those who live along the, the uh, Haldeman tract that we, you know, we have rare. Um, so I'd encourage, you know, when was last time you walked a rare trail? When was last time you made a contribution to an organization like rare also? Um, that, you know, this is about what we value most and um, and if, if you value that, uh, those kinds of spaces, I think it's also important that we consider how we contribute to those spaces too. Thanks. Um, so we're, we're coming close to the end of our time here. I want to make sure that we're not super rushed at the end. Um, Heather, did you have anything you wanted to add to this question? Just very quickly to build on Mike's point. Um, I'm based in Toronto. So uh, there are, you know, Toronto has a really fantastic ravine system and there mm -hmm. is quite a bit of 
more uh, forward thinking around urban planning, some of the waterfront um, restoration and um, adaptations they've been building, you are starting to see more uh, created wetlands down there. So there are opportunities to interact with nature and wetlands, even in urban environments. It's, it's not as hard to find as it might seem at face value. So getting the opportunity to learn about it in school, going to a property and participating in a, a program such as the ones offered that you described, Jenna, I also will sign up for <laughs> attending. Um, but it's finding opportunities where people are as much as possible. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think maybe, you know, sharing, sharing that love with a couple of your neighbors probably doesn't hurt, right? Bring a, invite a couple people out for, for a walk with you, because I think, um, well, several people have said, right, we have that innate connection, but maybe it, it, we need a little, a little nudge sometimes to, to remember it. Um, I think that's probably a great place to stop. And I'm, I'm doing my job well as a moderator to keep us on time. But I, I have, I, I think there's a couple more questions, but I don't know that we'd have time to really um, cover them fully with just a couple minutes left. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. I have really enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure the audience has as well. It's been a real pleasure to have you uh, give up some of your evening tonight to join us and to talk about wetlands, which I could talk about all day. Um, so I, at this point, I'm going to pass it back over to Philippe uh, Van Capelin just to wrap up uh, and to give some final remarks. Thank you. And uh, by the way, Maria, you've been a great moderator. Thanks for, for doing this. Um, yes, it's, it's been an amazing evening. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, the conversation. It's been very thoughtful, very uh, respectful also. Uh, so I would like to, uh, to end here by, again, thank you. Thanks again to our distinguished lecturer for, and, and also our amazing panelists for joining us and for being willing to stay with us for, for this time and to share your thoughts about wetlands connections between wetlands and humans, uh, kind of what we can do. I think it, it's, it's, it's always a good reminder, uh, but I think we need to also think about action and how we can move forward and at all levels of, of, of government, at all levels of community. So I also like to thank our, our audience, everybody's joined us today uh, for your interest in wetlands and, and hopefully uh, you find it as stimulating as, as, as we did. And so we hope then that we'll see you again next year. Maybe we'll see you even in, in person. So I wish everyone a great end of this uh, World Wetlands Day. So thank you all. Bye.